My name is Eric Schmidt. I'm a political science major here. Um, and I believe that hip-hop is very important. I believe it's an important language. I believe that it's a moment that is very close to becoming a movement. But when I think movement, I think political strategy. I think uh, political efficacy. And at the beginning of your talk, you offered a model. Um, it, was a, it was a simplified model, but a model by which popular culture influences public policy makers. And as a poli-sci person, I think there's so many intermediaries that need to be dealt with in between. Um, if the president of the NAACP isn't on board for the hip-hop movement, if the Congressional Black Caucus isn't on board, if the first African-American president of the United States isn't totally on board, I'm just not sure how this becomes something that affects social change. And you mentioned the McKinney-Clemente ticket, um, which, which, which is on board for much of the hip-hop agenda, but didn't even do very well by Green Party standards because of some comments that McKinney had made um, suggesting that she was in line with some 9-11 conspiracy theorists. So how do we get the strategy and the efficacy uh, aligned with where they need to be to affect public policy? Um, you bring up very important points, and I wanted to, I encourage you to go see what uh, Rosa Clemente laid out in, with her interview with Dave B. because she's bringing up some of those actually similar critiques. And it's not that she doesn't want it to be a movement. We all want to see social change, right? It's that it's part of a hip-hop aesthetic is to critique and critique and critique, agitate until that change happens, right? And so, um, so it's not that it's not wanted, it's that there is that idea that it hasn't happened to the extent in which we'd like it to. Um, but bringing some of the examples that you brought up are difficult for me to talk about. Um, ben Jealous was my brother's roommate in college, so I don't know how to talk about this right now. But I would say that Ben Jealous, you know, once was the PR agent for Dave Chappelle, who is considered sort of like a hip-hop generation comedian, is not, you know, one who definitely utilizes the intersection of hip-hop and politics and is as, as, it is, as is part of his comedy, comedic art, right? And so, is Ben Jealous, you know, or we, you were talking about Ben Jealous, right? The president, in the, the current president of the NAACP, not a hip hop president of the NAACP? Is he not? I mean, he's definitely a hip hop generation. Um, so, what makes him not hip hop um, or not supporting, supportive of hip hop? Is it his certain critiques here and there? Or, you know, I'm just, I would need more evidence as to why he would not be, given I, what I know about his work with Dave Chappelle in the past and other personal things that I can talk about in public. Uh, but, um, but also, um, the radio last week, uh, Mark Anthony Neal did, called Barack Obama a hip hop president. And so, is his critique, is his, perhaps his recent critique of Kanye West, make him not hip hop somehow, or does it make him actually hip hop and that he's criticizing um, things that he might not agree with? You know, I would, when, for example, me, if you were to read my dissertation, that was very harsh um, in regard to hip-hop, gender, and sexuality politics. And my, um, to the point where my uh, dissertation committee, uh, who originally uh, cautioned me against, so, certainly didn't caution me against, but they were very critical of hip-hop, gender, and sexuality politics themselves, uh, told me that I was being too harsh. And then I came here and saw Rennie Harris's piece where he was challenging childhood sexual abuse through his theater arts, and I completely changed my thesis. So I think that we don't have enough data, um, but there definitely are things happening under the radar, and maybe they have to be in order for us to realize that resource mobilization and redistribution. Um, and that was Tilly McCarty and Zoll, and trying to shout out the theorists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Toby. Uh, oh, wait, can you, can you go to the microphone? Alright, so my question for you is uh, in the civil rights movement, everybody was, like you talked about, um, people had to be, people had to be unified for a movement. Um, and I feel like during the civil rights movement, there was like, they wanted voting rights or they wanted removal of Jim Crow laws. Um, in our world today, what, what are the pressing issues for the hip hop generation? Because it's not so, it's not. Not everybody is unified, I guess, on one front. Um, so what do you think the pressing issues are for the hip hop generation of the day? And how do we unify on specific um, agendas, if you will? I think that last part of the question is a question for clinical psychologists. Um, seriously, kind of. I mean, I'm, I'm half to ingest, but how do we unify? Um, how do we, as, as, as human beings, move past 
these conceptions of difference to recognize how we're really the same and move forward so that everyone can enjoy you know, something equal from this earth, right? I mean, that, that, that's the philosophical question, and my hope is in you all is, as think tanks, as people who will be making the policy, people who will be producing the popular culture in the future, people who will be doing the research. My hope is that this is a question that will be sanely in our minds whenever we do the things that we do so that we can create a different and better world. Um, I would caution, though, looking back on the civil rights movement, and I'll try to burn a copy, I mean, I'll try, there might be a copy of that because of the book left behind or something so people can look at it or something like that um, in the first way. Um, and other places. Um, so, uh, but um, in that episode that Cousin Jeff uh, uh, did, the gap between, you know, from Freedom Ring to Bling Bling, the gap, is there a gap between civil rights and, and hip hop generations? Uh, the, we, Cornell West talks about, um, Looking, you know, being careful of this what we call Pollyanna view or rose-colored class view of what happened during the civil rights movement. Definitely, there were issues of gender and sexuality um, rights. Uh, the race and class analysis trumped the gender and sexuality analysis in certain cases in practice. Um, there, so there were there were issues of of of, of, of not having unity, and so it's not that. Um, so. It's important to recognize how policy change did take place, perhaps even in times when um, we didn't have all of these things that Charles Tilley theorizes about, the worthiness of unity numbers and committed and so forth. Or maybe we need to readdress, readdress how, what it is, what numbers means, and utilize alternative forms of media. Did that help? That kind of helps. Uh, but like, my question to you would be like, for that, like, all right, so during the civil rights, <coughs> the number one thing was equality. What is our impending oh. number one thing no. that, that we are fighting for or we should be fighting for? Different hip hop organizations have laid out their national and international political agenda. So the Universal Zulu Nation, if you go to ZuluNation.org or .com, I believe, they lay out what it is that they want. And it gets summarized in the peace, unity, and harmony, but then there's also like a number of different other points that have to do with ideas that I would generally say human equality because I'm not going to list them right now. Um, but to, to go, so there are transnational social movement organizations that lay out what it is that they want, and that is definitely within the uh, tradition of other social movements. If we look at Yvonne Bino's Stand and Deliver, there's a chapter in which she describes and, and it, uh, all different black political, salient black political social uh, movement. Sorry, salient black political agendas. She talks about Adam Clayton Powell's. Um, Position paper. She talks about David Walker's appeal. She talks about the six. I think it's a six-point plan from the Afro-American League of 1898. Someone help me. Uh, it's, it's in the book. Um, as well as uh, the eight. Uh, the no, it was an eight-point plan. And then the ten-point plan from Black Panther Party and so forth. So we've seen these. Uh, that would be a national political agenda. Like the ten-point plan from the Black Panther Party would be a national political agenda. And the hip hop political convention had a ten point plan as well that they when we say eight eight point plan that they laid out. It's just that in the first convention, only five of those points were able. We were only able to find unity among five of those. And the points that I mentioned, sexuality, gender, and media, were left out. However, in two thousand six and two thousand eight, those points were brought back in. So I do think that there's work on the ground happening to set up documents that state what it is that people want, but we also must realize that change, that we are the ones we're waiting for, right? And so maybe the next 10-point plan or three-point plan or whatever it is might come out of first wave. You know, you maybe, or, you know, you dub in general. You all are practicing, some of you all are, are, are moving or positioning yourselves to become profession, professionals in the arts. You can create popular culture that manufactures consent. Some of you are, are positioning yourself to go into policy or politics, or to do research that influences politics and politics. Uh, sorry, politics, politics and policy. It's late. Um, so the idea is that what are we doing? I, what are we doing? When I tell my students, and I told them at University of Florida long ago, I want them to wake up every day and, and ask themselves, today, am I going to maintain the status quo, or am I going to work for social change? 
And that is the same thing that I do at San Francisco State every day, practicing, doing the hard work, because I have a three-year-old, and his reality will be um, uh, more recognizing of his human equality more so than mine was, if I have anything to do with it. So, did that help? Uh, Carl? And, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, in this case, when you say it's movement, because, like, as a hip hop generation, <coughs> our movement, I think, is well ahead of, of the civil rights movement because it's brought up. Like, for example, like, Frederick Douglass spoke in his own writings of civil rights. That's when the idea of civil rights was brought up. You know what I mean? That far back. For example, like, we were only born, the hip hop generation, the hip hop culture was only born since the 80s. Starting in 2009, you know what I mean? So we're kind of ahead of the game, um, give or take that uh, the president without the hip-hop generation would be in office right now, um, in a lot of ways, simply because of us coming to age with the big clothing culture that was marketed with Obama's face and stuff like that, that was all hip-hop clothing, uh, music, his representative by the JP to the White House to have poets slam and stuff, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we have a hip-hop president, I think, you know what I mean? I feel like as a movement, we're, we're rolling faster. And the only reason we're rolling faster, I think, is because of media and stuff like that. But is it a movement? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I will, now I have to play up. That was an advocate, right? I was just, Amy B, and I was just on a panel with Bobby Seale um, a couple weeks ago in Berkeley, and he kept getting up and reciting like the Decor Declaration of Independence and, you know, Panthers' 10 point plan. and. He talked about his anthropology classes and his Africana studies classes that he had at Merritt College. And he was really advocating and critiquing our generation for not doing the research, for wanting to do the political work but not the research, for being very excited to go out to the streets without knowing what it is that has come before us, how they did it, why they did it, where it came from, where it went, what happened, what had happened. And I'm joking, right? And, and so I, I I was very happy to hear that um, because the day before I heard this from Bobby Seale, my, a colleague of mine who teaches research methods um, and research design, uh, his students in his, his class were saying, you know, we want to do something, we want to we be radical, we don't want to be sellouts, we want to go out in the street, we want to go into Hunter Point and Tutter's Point and change things right now. And his, you know, his comment, I don't know if he said this in his class, but his comment was, and you know, our comment afterwards was that, I'm scared to see what you all are going to do if you haven't checked out what happened in Hunter's Point to get things to what's happening to the current conditions and so forth, right? And so one thing I would, before we start patting ourselves on the back and talk about we got a president, we did this and we did that, is we need to step up our research. And we need to step up this anti-intellectualism if we are going to affect policy change. Because we don't know what's in the stimulus plan, if we haven't read the stimulus plan, if we haven't read the health care reform plan and so forth, then we might be all excited about Jay-Z and slam um, contests at the White House and so forth. But at some point, um, at what point is that made to pacify and manufacture consent and what's happening with your insurance plan or your opportunity, particularly for those that want to be um, profess practicing professional arts. Um, I worked for a long. I worked with people in the music industry, and many cultural workers do not have health care. So it's important that we activate and research and recognize research as activation. That was just my uh, mama moment. Jacqueline, did you have something? Hi, I'm Rachel Gak. I'm a student here in the ethnomusicology program, and I'm especially interested in Japanese pop music, and I, I would have been at your lecture, but I had a conflict this afternoon. So I, I was wondering if you could go into specifically in um, Japanese or larger Asian um, popular music situations. Um, here you're talking about the transnational social movement, and just wondering when is hip hop as, a, as aesthetic tools and as, a social, as sort of a set of techniques that people can access, and when is blackness an important part of that transnational movement, and again, sort of Sorry to make you recap part of what you said earlier today, but I'd love to hear more about it. Um, that is exactly what I've talked about today. I'm trying to figure out how to encapsulate that in one moment. It's straight, right? You can get it on the website tonight. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, so it'll be on the website, and absolutely, I think, I don't even have that slide, but basically the basic thesis 
was that Africana, imagined Africana identities are performed uh, as part of a political strategy, and these identities include um, aspects of blackness. So um, from the continent of Africa, absolutely. very much like what we saw with the Brazil and Thai film. I'll give you my card and we should have a longer conversation because I, at this time of night, I don't know how to uh, summarize it in some of an hour long talk. But yeah. I, all of that in my dissertation, there's a chapter coming out. <laughs> <laughs> like, Jasmine, hi. Um, I'm, a, I'm a political science major here also. So, um, I just wanted to say that I, I really disagree with um, the political science major up there. Um, <laughs> I think hip hop in its rawest form represents the purity of what this nation is built on. And I believe that we can parallel the growth of the virus with the growth of hip hop. And that the, the, when Nas says that hip hop is dead, and we look at um, the victimization of females and the dehumanization of characters played in the media, that that can also be parallel to and the things that we see on the street, and as relative and reflective. Um, that's what I have to say about that. My question to you is, um, what do you, you didn't speak much upon this, but I would really like to know your standpoint. Um, what, role, um, what role does post-traumatic slave syndrome have on gender interpretation in the media? And can we parallel slavery and its effects with today's hierarchy and roles of sexuality? Um, okay, um, you're asking, I, you were asking someone who's in the department of the uh, national experts on that theory, Kevin Washington and Dr. Wade Nobles. Dr. Kevin Washington and Dr. Wade Nobles um, are, are uh, psychologists in the uh, Department of Africana Studies that I teach that teach many courses from Brands Fanon to Black Psychology that deal with these issues. Um, that, I'm trying to think of the short answer to this question. There isn't a short answer. However, I want to have us look at what uh, Dr. Carla Stokes is doing with Hot Girls and the boss, that is the, the, the male, young male program that she's looking at. Um, and uh, the idea of utilizing hip hop to, as, as the popular culture that youth are identifying with and consuming, to raise ideas of critical media literacy and to teach basic lessons in Africana studies black psychology, that help people to recuperate um, assaults on uh, their self-esteem that they might learn from experiences in their communities, in their homes, but also from media that reifies or reproduces those experiences. Are you following me on that? And so I guess I'd like to focus on one of the solutions that I see happening and operating quite well. Um, based out of Atlanta, this is Hot Girls and Boss from Dr. Carla Stokes. You can look her up at drcarla.com, um, who is someone that has a degree in psychology as well as a degree in health education and health behavior. I think a master's in public health as well. Um, and she is utilizing all of this information in order to utilize technology and hip hop as an intervention to teach people the critical media skills they need to recuperate themselves and rescue their self esteem. There's theory on this, like decolonization, like I mean, so there and so forth. There's theory on um, how we can recuperate um, through, uh, first of all, recognizing the problem and then deconstructing how we learn these lessons about ourselves and fighting it through positive self-talk and so forth. There's theory and there's strategies, but one of the most important things that we can do as individuals as is operate in that realm ourselves and then make sure that things change for the lives of children. Earlier today, I was talking about children's programming that my son has the opportunity to consume or not consume, and why I choose for him not to consume certain you know, children's programming. And it is because of the lessons and ideas that people are learning about themselves. Um, Stuart Hall actually talks about this as well, and if you don't want to read his books, then look at his, um, his uh, documentary online, you can get a YouTube, Race the Floating Signifier, where he gets into all of these different ideas. Hi, uh, my name is Colin, and I'm also in the Ethnomusicology program here. Uh, but I wanted to ask a question about transnational aspects of hip-hop. Uh, I believe it was Ian Kondry who called it the flying spark in Japan, and it took off. I was wondering if you know of um, places where the spark did not ignite a flame, and 
places where you expect the spark of hip hop to take off in the future? Well, okay, I've traveled to, and this is something that Chuck D and I talk about a lot, because Chuck D travels a lot, more than me, obviously, as a continually touring artist, but I've traveled a lot, starting from the time, internationally, starting from the time that I was 14, and I'm not gonna tell you how old I am if I haven't already, but let's just say I'm not 14 anymore. Um, I have not seen hip hop not being represented anywhere. Does that make sense? When I first traveled abroad, to, uh, when I went to Russia when I was 15, to Moscow, elder generation, this is the time of the coup, when the, trans, the Soviet Union was, there was transitioning into the government that we see now. So Gorbachev, uh, Yeltsin had closed himself into the Kremlin, military were out in the streets, I was 15 years old, wondered why I couldn't call my parents, it was before email existed, as, as I knew of it, and I was wondering where I could get some pizza, and there was like food shortages and water pump breakdowns and so forth, okay? Being a 15-year-old and dramatic individual, as many 15-year-olds are, okay, um, I began to feel maybe lonely or alienated until I was walking one day and heard people singing in English, We Shall Overcome. Now, people weren't speaking. This is, Soviet Union was still technically working. People weren't speaking English out in the streets and so forth. And I was in a small town outside of Moscow called Lorenzacha. <laughs> so elders, what I would call elders, um, people that weren't your team, were meeting in community centers and utilizing black political moves, social movement music and culture to sort of kind of raise their vibrations or raise their attitudes or sort of mobilize in a time where people were uncertain and uneasy about political activity. People my age were listening to Run DMC. And even though Run DMC was kind of old at that point in time, you know, especially in like a, a child's mind, where, um, it like, cause that was two months ago, um, it was cool like enough for me to connect with it. And every place I've been all over the world, Japan, Sweden, Cuba, Brazil, like different places I go, there's always that hip hop home, and I have not not seen it anywhere. So unfortunately, I cannot give you any other. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> you know, I hope to go to Bali soon. So like, but I'm sure it's there. So I don't know. So um, I, I don't know of any place where that spark has been. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Maybe that's your task as an ethnomusicologist. Yes. What artistry do you see? as defying um, most, like, what artistry do you see as defying masculine heterosexual um, norms of hip hop? And I've noticed that there, that there is a community of uh, queer hip hop, or sometimes, I really hate this term, uh, noted as homo hop. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, would you, what do you think about the isolation of the queer community from hip hop? or it, isolation of a queer hip-hop community from the hip-hop community? Okay, so the you can ask me that question at the time that I, felt that I finished my dissertation in 2007. I had a similar critique in that there were these salient, politically progressive hip-hop movements, but that they weren't as, like Kadeek that collected from the Bay Area, and like what he considered homo pop and so forth, um, uh, and, and other, you know, other musical movements as well, or like, let's, let's take it to gender, the B Girl B Conference out of Minneapolis, and so forth, but the idea was that, my critique was that it wasn't being centered, and I have this theory that I came up, came up with called the church secretary syndrome, and that you know there's these, there's these um, non-normative, masculine, heterosexual, identified uh, male characters who, everybody, who stand on the shoulders of everybody who's worked this collective effort work that happens maybe during the week the same way a church secretary might be typing up newsletters and cleaning up the church and getting everything together and editing the sermon and so forth. But then when the lights go on and it's time for the sermon on Sunday, we just see the pastor, right? And so, and, and we remember that sermon and all of the accolades go to that one individual, that charismatic leader as Weber talked about, right? However, if they're standing on the, 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 the elbow grease of collectives, right? And until, my argument was that until those movements became more centrally located within this larger transnational hip hop movement, um, you know, hip hop wouldn't be a new social movement. It might be a social movement, not a new social movement. I disagree with that now. Um, and the reason is because depending on where you're located, often hip hop 
be it, even if that normative hip hop, that normal, normative mas normative masculinity, heterosexual identified, um, male character centered hip hop, continually operates as a site for contesting those identities. Um, and there's a brilliant scholar named C. Riley Snorton who's finishing his PhD, who will, he was writing a dissertation on this topic. Um, where even when we have um, characters such as, think about Kanye West and uh, rumors and, and, and journalism that surrounds Kanye West's sexual identity, right? It's the idea that um, because race as an identity um, always intersects with all these other identifications, uh, uh, Snorton, if I'm if correct, I hope I'm not wrong, but Snorton argues, no. sorry, uh, Snort, Snorton argues looking for a definition of race always constructed with all of those different identifications and more. Um, Snorton argues, this is C. Riley Snorton, argues that black, the sight of black bodies will always reference discussion about sexuality, um, gender, socioeconomic status, and, and so forth. And so even when we have these normative um, bodies um, being presented, there's discussion that's continually generated around these particular individuals. And also, um, depending on where you're located, what is considered marginal in some communities is centered in other communities. For example, I live in the Bay Area, and um, there's, there's definitely homophobic and heterosexism activity going on in the Bay Area. However, the hip hop politically progressive um, uh, community uh, at least the one that I'm a part of, incorporates um, all of these different groups and collectives and we work collectively together towards this goal of human equality, right? And so, and I think I see, from what I've seen from the few times I've visited Wisconsin, I see those sort of boundaries being pushed in the art that I see from students that are coming out of First Wave and um, I see that being represented that I just do panels and so forth. So, um, so I actually think that it's more central now than I did originally. Um, but I, we can keep talking on it, using information technology. Okay. Can we, I think we should do one more. Let's just, can we give it up for, for Professor Fisher?